it's now 12.30, so formal welcome to everybody. Um, we're about half the attendees have signed in so far, so I'm sure there'll be a few more joining us over the next few minutes, but we can get on with the introductions. So firstly, I'll introduce a colleague, Tim Cutfield. Tim, as many of you will know, has a long career in the ag sector with Fonterra, with Aggregate, and now with Levno. Um, Tim's um, curating the chats as they come in. So comments uh, as you wish, um, using either the Q&A section of your control panel or your chat. If there are questions for or comments that you want assembled and passed on to Jim, then uh, by all means use the chat, the chat facility and Tim will uh, aggregate those points uh, into some questions that we will drop into the conversation as we go. It's with particular pleasure that I uh, introduce you to Jim. Jim Wilson and I have had a uh, working professional relationship over more than three years. Um, took over from Rod Connor originally, who was the first uh, Ag Gateway Chief Executive whom I met. Um, Jim's now been a staunch advocate for New Zealand and for that matter Australia um, in aligning our expertise what's been developed in New Zealand, such as Data Linker, New Zealand Farm Data Standards and more, um, with other resources that are available internationally. There is a broad uh, breadth of understanding across um, Ag Gateway, um, Open Applications Group and many other international standards organisations of the merits and benefits of uh, broadly accepted standards um, as a prerequisite to interoperability and interoperability is a prerequisite to commercial collaboration, both between uh, companies with, with each other across the primary sector, and of course with the compliance uh, obligations with central and local governments. So uh, by way of a quick history, um, Tim, uh, Jim's been um, supporting the progress that we've made. So a very quick snapshot of Works that been work that's been achieved. Uh, what I'm keen to share with everyone is that there is a, a good body of momentum that has been building up over the last couple of years, and a number of folks that have been involved in that that work are present. But I'm also conscious that there are people somewhat newer to the process, newer to the journey, and so it, I thought a very quick snapshot of half a dozen quick points would be good. New Zealand as many will know, has put a lot of effort, work, investment into New Zealand farm data standards and into data linker. They are useful assets, but they're not globally aligned. When hardware, technology systems, um, software as a service products and, and various other assets are uh, um, integrated across state boundaries, across, across countries, local standards are useful, but they, they're not an international uh, interoperability standard. So whilst there is some very valuable asset work got into there that can be retained and and um, and in fact expanded, there are also merits in aligning with standards that are already accepted uh, in large parts of the world and especially by a couple of hundred or more of the very largest ag tech businesses in the world like Syngenta and John Deere and many others that Jim will no doubt expand on. The Precision Ag Association is the is the body that was formed uh, many years ago, originally by Craig McKenzie. Um, Tim and I are on the board of PANS. Um, PANS, by the way, just so you know, I'm, I'm sure it's broadly known, is in the process of merging with Agritech. It's re retaining its individuality, but it comes under the Tech Alliance banner. Um, it continues its focus on adoption and uptake, whereas Agritech tends to focus on um, uh, uh, product development and innovation. So PANS focuses, as we like to say, on farmer pull and, and Agritech focuses on supplier push. Um, the, the work has carried on under that banner. Um, two people in particular, Callum Eastwood and Brendan O'Connell, supported a lot of the work that's gone on over the last couple of years. We then achieved a milestone at the end of 2018 where the whole PANS committee or PANS board uh, ratified a set of proposals that were put forward uh, to go outside of PANS for discussions amongst its members and on a wider forum. And that's um, that's led to increased dialogue around this, this matter. 
Jim then was invited to attend and run a full day seminar before Agritech, uh, sorry, Mobile Tech 2019 in Rotorua last year. That was attended by 50 people or so. Uh, and again, more progress was made and more clarification, more recognition of the merits and benefits of alignment with global standards. MPI then held a workshop in Wellington um, on the 26th of February, a different 50 people, similar number, uh, some in common, uh, but a number of new faces with a particular emphasis from uh, local and regional government were very visibly present at that workshop. And a lot of work has come out of that. And Collier Isaacs is curating the documentation that's been derived from that workshop. The next stage was to have been a full day seminar in Rotorua last week, the day after Mobile Tech, but for obvious reasons, those events were both cancelled and have gone online. And that's why we are here today. So we now have increasing recognition from farming, from industry, from academia, from industry bodies, from research organisations and from central and local government, particularly under the banner of the uh, Industry Transformation Plan that David Downs is, is managing on behalf of MB, MFAT, MPI and, and um, MFE and other work that's going on, uh, particularly with, under the Agritech banner. So we are now where we are at the first of the four sessions that we are looking at uh, these two topics of standards and interoperability. It's now my pleasure to hand over to, to Jim. Jim is uh, Chief Technology Officer for Ag Gateway and his primary role is as Chief Executive Officer of Open Applications Group International, which is an organization based in the United States, but it's truly global. Uh, and Jim will expand on that. And welcome, Jim, from your home in Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah, thank you, Kenneth. I appreciate it. And uh, well, it's good to be with you all uh, virtually. I can attest to you that my wife wishes that uh, we were with you personally. We were scheduled to be in Queenstown today, but uh, that didn't work out. So. Or we're looking for a, a reason to get back there once all this uh, COVID stuff clears up. So um, today, let me share my screen and we will get rolling. All right, so today is the first workshop of four workshops and they're all 90 minutes. I think you all know that. And I will be presenting the first three with uh, Kenneth and Tim kind of moderating, looking in the control panel for questions and things like that. Then the fourth one will bring uh, more people to the table to discuss implications. So this webinar, actually, let me move forward to the sessions here. So, so we have this webinar today, and then three days from now, we have the mobile tech session, which is just a 15 minute session. And it's not part of the webinar series, but I include it in the list here. Uh, if you haven't registered for mobile tech, uh, you should uh, consider that. There's a, a great group of speakers lined up for that, and they do a fantastic job. Um, so today we'll be on kind of standards, benefits, influencers, and more. We're going to get into value. We're going to get into a lot of things that should be fundamental or are fundamental. And I think you'll recognize them as fundamental, but it's really astonishing to me that so many people sort of skip over them or don't recognize the importance. And so we're going to cover that content to make sure we're all on the same page because that'll be the foundation for sessions two and three. Uh, we will also get into uh, a discussion about some of the key standards organizations out there. We won't have time to cover them all. We want to leave some time for Q&A. And, uh, and then at the end, of course, we'll have some, some question and answer time. The real meat and potatoes of this webinar series are the webinars uh, two or sessions two and three, uh, next Monday and the Monday after that. That's where we really dig deeper into uh, the standards that are available, what may apply to New Zealand or agriculture in general or the world more generally. Uh, one thing we'll, we'll discuss at some point is how the lines are blurring between 
agriculture and other industries. I touched on that a year ago in Rotorua. I had a couple slides on that uh, showing uh, an F-35 aileron and Land O'Lakes uh, cheese and how they both use the same bill of lading uh, or bill of materials for the production processes. So anyway, uh, again, uh, sessions two and session three next Monday and the following Monday are really the kind of the deeper dive into what standards are available. So yeah, today, just one quick point, that's your Monday, it's our Tuesday, of course. Oh, yeah, good point. So it's funny because I, I sent somebody an email today and uh, I gave him, I was on New Zealand time in my head and I, I referenced uh, Tuesday instead of Monday. So yeah, yeah, good point, Tuesdays. Okay, so I'm going to stop showing my screen. You guys have seen enough of my face. I'm sorry, my uh, my video, and also to preserve bandwidth, and we'll march on. Okay, so a few points before we dive into the content. So first of all, so I, uh, about an hour ago, hour and a half ago, I submitted all of your email addresses to Ag Gateway's Atlassian Confluence system in order to create accounts, or if you already have Atlassian accounts, associate your account with Ag Gateway. So first of all, a note on privacy. Your email addresses are not visible to other people, as far as I know. And that gateway is not going to use them for anything. You're just one of now 1,600 people who have accounts on, on the Ad Gateway wiki. So the reason for sending that is so that you can add, access content that is a companion to this webinar series. Let me just show you that here. You see it on screen, it's really pretty simple. And presently, the content is organized by workshop. These three days, all the content is hidden from you other than the workshop description right now. But for today's workshop, all of the content we're covering is listed here in more detail than what you will see in the slides. And then yes, of course, you can have a PDF uh, copy of the slides following the presentation but the content is here i invite you to explore it there's some things that i'm not going to cover there are things that i will cover in today's session that i won't cover into the same level of detail that are expressed here in the wiki uh, and we may come back and visit this uh, a little later okay oh a couple things here i forgot to mention I really encourage you that as you look at the wiki, let's just go on the value page here. You are welcome to offer comments and there's two ways to do it. You can go to the bottom here and you can add a comment. Another way to do it is if you want to comment on some particular text is just highlight that text and then a little thing pops up here and you can click comment and then just type a comment. So. Okay, you're welcome to ask questions, offer suggestions for improvement, anything goes. And note that other people will be able to see your comments too. And if for some reason that gets out of hand, we'll figure out what to do. We generally don't have any problems in our gateway with people abusing their wiki privileges. Okay. And uh, also, of course, I will be making updates to this. While I have presented all of this content in various ways over the past 20 years, to some degree. This is the first time it's arranged in this set of four webinars, really three, with the fourth one being more of an implications for New Zealand. So I'm really pulling content from several years worth of experience and content development. And so you'll see a lot of updates in there over the next two weeks. Moving on to who made this possible. So I'm grateful to Kenneth for his tireless efforts to put this together, make connections, send emails, organize, go to webinar, give advice, review presentations. It's been all great. And any mistakes, of course, are, are on me, not him. Appreciate Agritech New Zealand support and the Precision Ag Association New Zealand. And as I think you know, they're, they're currently merging. Also, the, the group at Mobile Tech, Ken Wilson, and, and his crew have been great. They invited me to speak again this year. And then, of course, as Ken said, I am employed or contracted technically to two organizations. I wear two hats. One is president and CEO of the Open Applications Group, 
and Wong as the Chief Technology Officer for Ag Gateway. And I will go into more detail about those organizations. Now, in the wiki, I have some statements about what my motivations are, what my biases might be, more details about myself, uh, professional history, educational history, and things like that. I won't get into that. You're welcome to go there. But one highlight here is my intention is to inform you about a lot of stuff related to interoperability. Of course, I have an interest in your company exploring benefits of joining at Gateway and possibly even OEGI. Definitely at Gateway would apply in this case. Again, thanks to all these folks who made this possible and moving on to the content. One important aspect of agriculture is this concept called digital agriculture. I've heard it discussed quite a bit or mentioned quite a bit over the last few years, and I could not find a definition, or at least I couldn't find one that was broad enough to cover agriculture. In some cases, there would be something specific to a domain, maybe like equipment or something. So I set about making my own definition of digital agriculture. Uh, that would certainly meet my needs with respect to explaining interoperability. You can see it on screen. Digital agriculture is the agricultural production of food, fiber, and fuel through processes that are increasingly autonomous and driven by increasingly effective models with data input that is increasingly timely, relevant, accurate, complete, and trusted. The models are designed to maximize profitability, and sustainability in optimal balance. So there's a lot in there. We don't have time to unpack that, but I would encourage you to consider it. You'll see a definition in the wiki for this, and I welcome your comments there. Interoperability. You know, I, I've seen a lot of presentations and I've seen a lot of a lot of cases where definitions are plucked from Oxford Dictionary of English. You know, it just seems a little bit of a cop out. But in this case, it's like, boy, I think we really need to agree on some key terms here uh, because they're the foundation for all the meat and potatoes stuff that I'll discuss with you next week and the following week. Interoperability, the ability of computer systems or software to exchange and make use of information. And then you've got an example there. I pretty much agree with that. Moving on, value. And we're going to get into value in some detail. So value, the material or monetary worth of something, the worth of something compared to the price paid or asked for. Standard, something used as a measure, norm, or model in comparative evaluations. And then a form of language that is widely accepted as the usual form. And I'm going to go ahead and declare that that would also apply to data formats and things like that, APIs. Interoperability is central to so many things. And so let me illustrate that. We have interoperability and then we have digital agriculture. If you're going to achieve digital agriculture, if you're going to have better decision making based on better models, based on better data, more timely, accurate, complete, trustworthy data, interoperability is required. If you can't get data from one party to another or from one system to another, it falls apart. And if you can't do that, you can't create value because interoperability enables value creation and digital agriculture enables value creation. And all of that is enabled by standards. And when I say standards, generally I will also be referring to guidelines, best practices, tools, other resources. And we'll get into some of those mostly next week and the week after. Let's talk about value, what it is and who decides. When I bring up value, my experience is that people tend to tune out like, yeah, yeah, I know what that means. But what I find is that so much tension and misunderstanding in business or disappointment or unmet expectations are a result of not sharing the same concept of value or not agreeing on what is valuable. Let's talk about what is value. 
Okay. And then, well, who decides what value is? Is the answer to that question just up to anybody? I would argue not, that it's really owners who decide what value is. And the reason is, is this whole webinar series is about business. Owners own businesses, and they're the ones that ultimately call the shots. They get to decide what value means. What do owners value? Well, you got some friends setting off fireworks here. So do owners value friendship, family, beauty, sport? Well, yeah, of course, they value all those things. But that is not what we're talking about when we talk about business. The thing owners value is cash flow. Let's talk about what that means. It's for some people, it's not obvious. And we're going to walk through it. So we have some cash now. C is cash. Zero is a time of zero. We have some cash now. And then we're going to add some cash later. That's C for cash, T for some time T. But the thing is, since cash later happens later, it's not worth to you the same thing now as if you had the cash now. So if you want to sort of compare apples to apples, you need to discount it. And that's where one plus R to the T comes in. R is the discount rate and T is time. And so this whole thing is what's called today's present value of a future cash flow. So then we add all of the cash flows up in the future from the time of the first future cash flow to the time of the last future cash flow. And what we end up with is the net present value. So the net present value adds up all the stuff on the right. Okay. So let's talk about this formula in action. And this should be common sense to you, but I'm telling you, it just seems like so many people advocating various projects just don't pay attention to it or forget about it. So we have time on the X axis. We have cash flow on the Y axis. And we have some cash flows. So going up from the x-axis are is cash received, income, and the red blocks going down from the y-axis are payments or expenses. And so let's say that this is what your cash flow is today and looking into the future. So the first thing is you increase the cash receipt. I mean, that's totally obvious, right? So if you have a cash flow and you increase the amount of that cash flow, it's going to increase value. The next one will be you add a cash receipt. It should be pretty obvious too. If you add an entirely new cash flow, your net present value goes up. Okay, the next one is if you reduce a cash payment, if you have an expense, and you can chip away at it and reduce it, then you've increased your value. And similar to the uh, receiving an entirely new cash flow, if you just eliminate an expense altogether, all other things being held equal, you increase your net present value. Okay, another way to create value is receive cash sooner. So if we look out there at Time seven, there's a bunch of cash out there. And if we move it forward to time five, we've improved value or increased value. And then similarly, if we have a cash payment or an expense that we can put off paying until later, then that will increase value too. Hopefully all of this is intuitive for you. But like I said, it just seems that people just forget about this or don't think about it with respect to decision-making uh, around projects. Um, another one, this is less obvious, is if you're able to make cash receipts less risky. So we have some risky income expected in the future. And if we can turn those risky cash flows, projected cash flows into less risky, we've increased value. Let's go to Excel and just see how this plays out. Okay, so this is a very simple file here. And we have, we have income and we have expenses. And then across in row two, we have some years, 2021, 2022, 23, 24, 25. 
And we can go in here and we can change the amounts of the cash flows. And it updates the graph. How do we calculate what the net present value is? Imagine this is a project. Imagine that you are trying to persuade your executive management, or maybe you are an executive at a company, and one of your managers comes to you and says, hey boss, I think we ought to do X. Wouldn't it be nice if they could estimate the cash flows in the future? Because ultimately, that's what senior management is for, to make sure that they maximize shareholder value. So here we have all of these values duplicated in this table over here. Step one here is what's the net cash flow for a time period? In this case, we say equals this plus this. And you might think, well, wait a second, shouldn't you subtract the out from the in? Well, yeah, but they're expressed in negative values anyway, so we're good. So we just drag that down and we have the values there. And actually, let me go back up here and make this one 10. All right, so the next thing is compute time. Today, March 13th for me in Raleigh, March, or I'm sorry, April 13th for me in Raleigh, April 14th for you in New Zealand, we're at time zero, and then this time is simply gonna be uh, this time minus this time. This is in days. Notice down here we have this discount rate. This is an annual discount rate. Okay, and this would be particular to your company, or if you don't know what it is for your company, it would be something, an estimation for an industry. Or if you're really sophisticated, it would be an estimate for the project itself. But in this case, I just say it's 13%, and we won't have time to get into the details about how you come up with this number. But this is an annual number, this is in days. So we need to go back in here and we need to divide by 365 to get the number of years. Okay, so that's how many years in the future that is. And then if we copy this down, we're gonna see a problem. And what's the problem? Well, the problem is that we need to anchor everything to this date today as the present value. So we need to go in here and set this to absolute. And then we'll copy it down again. And there we go. So that's the time. And then the present value we said. So in this case, this just equals this. And by the way, the dash there is just because it's formatted differently. It's still a zero. And so here we say equals the net cash flow divided by one plus the discount rate to the power of the time. And then we can copy that down. And then if we add it all up, we get 12.46. This is what we call the MPV. So now if we go over here, you might think, well, gosh, that's a lot of math going on there. Is there a simpler way to do it? And the answer is yes. Excel has a handy formula. And this is not an Excel webinar, but this is just to demonstrate value. So I can say XNPV, and I can choose the rate, and I can choose the values. And I can choose the dates. And you can see here, we get the same thing, 12.46. One of the reasons for demonstrating this to you is this is like MBA program finance 301, just basic MBA finance math, capital budgeting stuff here. It's not rocket science. And the point here is that when you're thinking about interoperability, and you're thinking about, should I do this project or should I do that project? I would encourage you to make a stab at creating a financial model. If I do this project, what are the incremental cash flows for my company? What's the cost to do it? What are the costs over time? What are the 
changes in income I can expect as a result of it? What are trade-offs with other projects? Things like that. Hopefully you have some confidence this is not rocket science. Of course, if you come in here and you change anything, let's say we go here and we change this to minus five, that increases the MVP. And if we go down here and change this to nine, that increases the NPV. Let's get back to the presentation. Decision making. This is the process of choosing among alternative projects. So what you want to start with is you want to identify potentially valuable projects. And again, in the context of interoperability, you can't do everything. So what are you going to choose? So you want to compute the net present value for each of the projects. And then you choose the one, or maybe it's a set with the highest NPV. So often within a company, there's like a program management office or portfolio management office. And they're looking at, here's all the things we're doing in our company. We have X amount of money. We have such and such a budget for the upcoming year. And as executives in the company, they have an obligation to the owners, to the shareholders, to use the money in the best way possible, which in fact could be just give it back to shareholders. You see that happen a lot with, for example, dividends. Maybe there's one set of projects make sense and other projects don't because some projects deliver a higher net present value than others. The reality is pretty messy though. So what I showed you was just crazy simplistic. I'll show you something a little more complicated in a second. We're not going to put numbers in. I'm just sort of going to do a flyby. Oh, there we go. Okay. So uh, four decisions can be avoided by at least making an effort to apply these principles. Everybody's time is at a premium. Often decisions are made at a gut level, but thinking in terms of cash flows and net present value can help you improve your decision making considerably. I want to show you a barcode value calculator demo. This is child's play. This is a little more involved. And of course, we're not going to read it and we're not going to go through it. But this is something that at Gateway worked on a couple of years ago, and it was led by a gentleman from Syngenta and had input from other crop input manufacturers and distributors and even a couple of uh, machinery manufacturers participated. And the idea here is what is the cost or, or what is the value of implementing automated identification systems in the industry? This sheet is just all instructions. This is a calculator for manufacturers. This is a calculator for distributors. Here's a calculator for retailers. Here's raw input and some instructions there. And so here is where you put input for financial information. Okay, it talks about all sorts of savings you can expect from uh, labor and barcode material and shrinkage and just you name it. It covers all sorts of stuff. Here's the raw input for efficiency savings for manufacturers, distributors, and retailers. And I can blow it up for manufacturers. So it gets into a lot of detail. Production orders inspected at storage facility offsite. Production orders received and stored at storage facility offsite. Here's savings estimated due to accuracy. So if you, if you implement automated identification systems for products, you can reduce the stolen product costs, lost inventory costs, counterfeit product costs, et cetera. The idea here is taking the principles that I discussed before, you take a model that's more elaborate like this and you implement it for your company and you just plug in the values. If the model has been implemented for an industry, which you have to be careful because as nonprofit industry associations, there are various jurisdictions have antitrust regulations that you have to be careful uh, to, to avoid violating. And so I know in the United States, the antitrust regulations are pretty strict and Ad Gateway behaves very strictly in its collaborative efforts. But 
But in terms of creating a model where each company would fill in their own numbers and don't share, we're good to go. This is just an example of something a lot more elaborate than the one we started out with a minute ago. So let's talk about competitive advantage. Maybe you get value like, okay, yeah, Jim, um, I get it, value is important. I, I have an obligation to increase value for my company. Well, one thing that you will hear discussed quite a bit is this concept of competitive advantage. The seminal work on this topic is the book Competitive Advantage, Creating and Sustaining Superior Performance by Harvard's Michael Porter. Porter claims that typically companies plan to achieve and sustain competitive advantage through one or both of the following approaches, through operational effectiveness or strategic positioning. And Porter stresses that operational effectiveness is not a strategy. Porter describes competitive advantage as strategic positioning that attempts to achieve sustainable competitive advantage by preserving what is distinctive about a company. It means performing different activities from rivals or performing similar activities in different ways. So notice here that there's a couple things that are different. Performing different activities from rivals, or performing similar activities in different ways. Hopefully some of you are scratching your head saying, well, wait a second, isn't this about standards and interoperability? And we're talking about doing things differently? Well, let's dive into that a little bit. So with competitive advantage, again, performing different activities from rivals and performing similar activities in different ways than rivals. Well, what about standardized? Well, that pretty much performs some of the same activities as rivals and performs some similar activities in the same ways as rivals. So here we have do things differently and do things the same. So which is it? You know, don't we have conflicting objectives here? Isn't standardization the very act of giving up on sustainable competitive advantage? Well, not so fast. Uh, the key word is some, okay? Now, the questions are which ones and why? The reason that standards matter in a world of competitive advantage is that the more innovative a company is, the more they want to just standardize some of the fundamentals of an industry and just sort of move forward. You can think of it as, hey, let's all collaborate on some of the lower level stuff and we'll compete, we'll just beat each other up in the marketplace on the higher level stuff. Now, of course, not everybody agrees on what the foundational stuff is or lower level stuff and what the higher level stuff is, and there are games that can be played. But I think you would agree that having your own purchase order format is probably not a point of competitive advantage that you, you want to suggest to your boss that your company pursues. Probably the same thing for a field operations work order or maybe a dairy operations work record. Who knows? But competing on different data formats is, in my view, not the way to go. So let's get into who are all these folks that set standards? Who's who and why should you care or why should you not care? And we'll start out by going through some influencer categories here. In the world of standards, we'll start with governments. Governments will enact laws, set and execute policies. Often legislation references standards. I shouldn't say often, I will say sometimes laws reference standards. Governments can influence standards by how they function. They can have a group that does research like uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the United States who has some influence over standards. And sometimes governments even set standards themselves. And, and by the way, the whole context here is data and data management related standards. 
And then finally, governments can influence standards through funding. So they can offer grants for standards development. In an unintentional side effect, they will offer grants for certain research or development that ends up just creating confusion in the sense that the field of study is worth studying, but the work itself produces a lot of uncertainty because people say, oh, well, this work's happening over here, but I have this standard there. I'm not quite sure what I should do. Should I wait until that research is done? Governments play a big role. So next is the global de jure standards organizations. There are four of them that are widely recognized, and we will go through each one of them here in a minute. The de jure means from law or having the force of law. And these are the sorts of standards that are referenced by governments in laws. And there can also be national de jure standards as well. Those would be done by national standards organizations. And then moving on, there can be multinational standards organizations. And by that, I mean organizations that set standards on behalf of a number of companies or, or I'm sorry, countries or represent a bunch of countries. So SIN in Europe is one of them and we'll cover them in a minute. And then there's industry and professional associations. So that's Ag Gateway and PANS and, and organizations like that. They can set standards or otherwise influence standards. Also, there's just general associations. I didn't want to leave anybody out. Next are companies. Of course, companies participate in industry associations and send their people or sponsor their people in professional associations and also sponsor their people in the global de jure standards organizations and national standards organizations. But they can just sort of create standards that are called de facto standards. The world just sort of agrees to them and uses them. Sometimes they like what they use and sometimes they get a little frustrated. So examples of this would be Microsoft's ODBC back in the day for database connectivity or Esri's shapefile. So another thing are initiatives. These are consortiums of companies that don't really have necessarily a separate legal entity, but they agree to cooperate on standards. And, and we'll cover one of those a little bit here in a minute. And then there are informal groups. And so a good example of that is a group in the United States that got together to develop soil testing standards. I mean, informal groups, just getting together and taking some initiative is great but one of the challenges that you face with informal groups is the provenance of the intellectual property so if they do work who owns it who is willing to implement it not knowing the provenance of the intellectual property not having a license to use it they run the risk of patent infringement and things like that a gateway is in the process of addressing a situation just like that with a soil testing standard such that we can take it in claim ownership with support of all of its varied contributors and then publish it as a proper standard and then finally people there are personalities out there that can actually have just have a big influence they're kind of bigger than the organization so an example of that would be like tim berners lee at the World Wide web consortium okay so um we're going to go through some organizations and again we're not going to cover them all just a quick word on completeness. While the organizations addressed in this section are noteworthy, not all noteworthy organizations are mentioned. You can see the accompanying online resources for a more complete and growing list. Okay, so the first one, uh, you may recall I mentioned the de jure standards organizations, the organizations that uh, you know are often mentioned in or referenced in legislation, and probably the world's most well-recognized standardization organization is ISO, uh, or the International Organization for Standardization. Which, by the way, it doesn't stand for that. We'll get to that in a second. Okay, uh, I, for, so for all of these organizations, I, I expand the name if necessary. I list the web address and then make a couple of statements about them. And again, all of this information is in the wiki that you should have access to. ISO is an independent, non-governmental, international organization with a membership of 164 national standards bodies. 
Okay, so this is not a throwaway sentence here. Okay, the, the real important part of this is ISO's membership is composed of countries, national standards bodies. Okay, so in the United States, that standards body, that standards body is ANSI, the American National Standards Institute. And then ANSI will in turn designate various other organizations to set standards in uh, various ISO uh, standards work. Uh, I actually, I don't know for sure. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if, uh, if for New Zealand it was Standards New Zealand, but uh, maybe somebody could confirm that and post it in the chat window. But anyway, uh, 164 countries designate uh, a, an organization, either, either a, a department or agency in their government, or they may uh, name an outside uh, non-governmental agency or, or organization to represent the country, okay? And so then the next point is through its members, it brings together experts to share knowledge and develop voluntary consensus-based market relevant international standards that support innovation and provide solutions to global challenges. All right, so uh, I suspect that you're familiar with their standards. Uh, you have probably seen them online. They, you need to pay for most of them. There are a few that are available for free. So a couple that come to mind are the ISO country code list. Uh, I think the ISO currency code list is free as well. But most of them are, I don't know, they, the, the, you know, I've bought a few dozen of them and they're somewhere between, you know, like 50 US dollars to 250 US dollars. Okay, oh, and by the way, fun fact here, uh, again, ISO does not stand for International Organization for Standardization or any variation of it. It is actually, it derives from the Greek isos, meaning equal. So um, I'm, if, I, if you need to leave right now and share that fun fact with somebody, I'll, I'll understand. Okay, next is UNCFAC, the United Nations Center for Trade Facilitation and Electronic Business. It is a subsidiary intergovernmental body of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, which serves as a focal point within the United Nations Economic and Social Council for Trade Facilitation Recommendations and Electronic Business Standards. Now, um, they are the second, uh, or they are, are another of the four de jure, global de jure standards organizations. Now, one thing that trips people up is they think, oh, UNCFAC, that's part of UNECE. Uh, so, so it's Europe-based. That, that's not quite right. Uh, the UNECE was established, as, as I understand it, after World War II to oversee the kind of the economic recovery of Europe. So its scope is global, and it just sort of carries that, uh, that name as legacy, okay? Its membership is global, so um, I, I, I'm not right now, but I used to be part of the United States delegation, which was managed by the United States government, uh, the GSA, General Services Administration, or something like that. Um, so, so countries, attend meetings and 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 really they attend meetings via uh, declared delegates okay and its members are experts from intergovernmental organization individual countries authorities and also from the business community all right the next one is the international telecommunication union itu and it is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies, ICTs. Um, and I'm not gonna read all of that. Again, it's all here and in the wiki, but uh, they create all sorts of standards related to uh, global radio spectrum, satellite orbits, um, just all sorts of uh, what, what we call ICT there. Um, so they, they make the claim that every mobile phone call, internet access, and email is made possible by ITU's work. 
So they are a heavy hitter. Um, just backing up quickly. So ISO and UNCFAC seem to have a big presence in the kind of the business interoperability world. Uh, ITU, not so much uh, at kind of a business level, certainly at a technical level. And then these guys, IEC, the International Electrotechnical Commission, they're even more uh, further along the geek spectrum, okay? So they were founded in 1906 and it's world's leading organization for the preparation and publication of international standards for all electrical, electronic, and related technologies. Um, again, they, they, are, they are very technical. Now, one phenomena you may see from time to time is you'll see a standard that is, let's say, uh, IC, ISO slash ITU, you know, 14857 or some number. I just made that up. And the idea there is sometimes uh, the two of these four groups, or, may, or maybe even three or four, I've only heard of two at a time, they'll get together and they'll establish uh, what you'll see a lot as a JWG, a joint working group, to do some work. And then they'll publish a standard. Also, from time to time, you will see uh, one group submit one of their standards to the other standards body. So, for example, in UNC FACT, when I was a U.S. delegate, we developed, I, I led a working group in, in UNC FACT called the Core Component Working Group. And we produced, uh, I, I was the working group leader for version three of the Core Component Technical Specification. UNC FACT submitted that to ISO, and then ISO reviewed it, revised it a bit, and then they publish that same standard as ISO 15,000 part five. Okay, so those are the four de jure standards organizations, uh, ISO, UNCFAC, ITU, and I IEC. So now, uh, moving on to national standards organizations, uh, there's Standards New Zealand, uh, New Zealand's leading developer and publisher of standards and standard solutions. You've got the website there. It's a business unit within the Ministry of Business, Innovation, and Employment. Uh, it specializes in standards management and development and publishes and sells New Zealand and joint Australia, New Zealand, and international standards. And uh, I, by the way, I read the, uh, the industry transformation plan cover to cover. I uh, wrote a number of, of comments on it. it, it it's really impressive work, I think. And uh, um, I, I encountered MB, MBIE in reference to that publication here and there quite a bit. Okay, so that's Standards New Zealand. Uh, then there's PANS, uh, and I, I, I couldn't help uh, uh, putting in the, the first uh, initialism dereferencing I came up with on Google, the physiotherapy Acupuncture Association New Zealand. So maybe all that problem goes away after the merger with Agritech and Zed, but uh, we'll see. But uh, PANS, Precision Ag Association New Zealand. Uh, primary goal is to advance precision ag in New Zealand. Um, and I'm sure most of you on this call know more than is even written here. Uh, and as Kenneth stated at the beginning, he's, he's been involved in that. I think uh, Tim has been as well. And then there's uh, Agritech New Zealand, or as uh, some of you guys call it, Agritech NZ, uh, launched a couple of years ago. It's Ag uh, Agritech New Zealand is a purpose-driven, membership-funded organization whose members share a passion for the opportunities that Agritech can generate. And it connects innovators, investors, regulators, researchers, and interested public. It promotes opportunities and challenges raised by Agritech. Agritech New Zealand advances the ecosystem through advocacy, collaboration, innovation, talent, and economic growth through international connections and missions. And uh, if you were here at the beginning of the webinar, you uh, heard me mention or, or acknowledge Agritech as, as one of the organizations that made this possible. And, you know, uh, if I do a good job in these webinars, uh, I think they've... Uh, They've helped advance their mission just a bit. 
Okay, so the next, I kind of combined three things on one slide because uh, <laughs> it's a little fuzzy about our, you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier all these categories of, of standards influencers and one category was projects or initiatives. So we have New Zealand Farm Data Standards, New Zealand Farm Data Code of Practice and Data Linker, and they're all uh, related. Uh, they were developed through funding from Dairy NZ, uh, the Red Meat Profit Partnership and the Ministry of Primary Industries. And uh, well, the New Zealand Farm Data Standards uh, developed uh, standards for uh, around farm data. Uh, the Farm Data Code of Practice uh, takes a very serious look at, at how farmers can uh, both protect their data, but uh, provide it to uh, service providers and, and other trusted advisors to uh, provide them some actionable insight. And then DataLinker provides a framework and agreement process to reduce duplicate data collection and streamline data sharing. Uh, DataLinker helps industry organizations to connect. Um, and there's, there's a really important point here. And the reason I say it's important is because Ag Gateway suffers from misperception in this area. And it is the very last statement under data linker. There's no central database of farm data. Farmers are exceptionally um, aware of where their data goes, or at least they, they like to think they are. Um, and I have no reason to believe otherwise. And so any organization that wants their data is immediately sort of suspect. And so making the claim credibly and uh, keeping that claim that you're not uh, storing their data is, is an important point. And we'll get into more of that next week, by the way. Uh, or no, not next week, uh, two weeks from now. We'll get into the Farm Data Code of Practice and we'll look a little bit at the, uh, what's happening in the United States with the uh, American Farm Bureau and, and a similar uh, set of guidelines there. All right, the next one is Standards Australia. I think there's a bunch of Australians on the call. I don't have a lot to say here, but I thought it was a really cool logo and um, uh, just wanted to give a shout out to Standards Australia. Uh, the next is SIN. I mentioned SIN earlier as one of those uh, one of those organizations that's like a multinational organization, and you can see there SIN is the European Committee for Standardization, and it's an association that brings together the national standardization bodies of 34 European countries. Um, I'm, I'm not positive I should look into this, but I'm pretty sure it's sort of like the standards arm of the EU uh, or, or the European Commission, I'm not sure which. I, I need to look into that a little more. And and by the way, toward the end of all this, we're going to talk about uh, relationship as the key. So uh, so anyway, there, there's SIN. So the next one is ANSI. This is the American National Standards Institute. I mentioned them earlier. They are the organization designated by the United States government to manage uh, the U.S involvement in ISO, okay? And so they will do things like uh, uh, a credit committee. So, so one ANSI committee that was well known a few years ago, maybe not so much nowadays, is ANSI ASC X12. So ANSI ASC uh, accredited uh, standards committee and the X12 is the committee designator and they're the ones that created EDI standards for the United States and kind of North America at large but uh, it didn't gain global traction because UNC fact who I mentioned earlier they created EDIFACT and it was a little different so uh, so anyway An ANSI has an important role in the United States and uh, well I'll show you an example of that here in a couple minutes uh, next is DIN, and by the way, we're going to pick up the pace a little bit here. So DIN is, is you know, sort of like Standards New Zealand uh, for Germany. Uh, then there's CNIS, same thing for China. And by the way, I, I serve as the 
uh, the chair of the technical advisory group to ISO TC154. And the Chinese uh, have designated a person to chair that committee and provide secretariat or provide the secretary role for that committee. And the secretary is from CNIS. So China is asserting itself uh, a little more in the standards world, it seems to me. And uh, they, they seem to be very well organized when they, when they propose standards. And so, you know, it's, it's important that we're all at the table and uh, making sure everybody's interests are, are, are addressed. Okay, the next one, and this is, uh, you know, I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Ag Gateway. So we were, we were founded 15 years ago, and our mission is to lead the global transition to digital agriculture. And of course, by doing that, we, you know, improve data sharing, uh, improve opportunities for uh, productivity and efficiency and things like that. We develop standards, guidelines, reference data services, and tools to enable interoperability. We promote collaborative interoperability projects. So one that we won't get into, we'll talk a little bit about it maybe next week if we have time is, is a project around channel integrity uh, to actually implement uh, barcoding or some form of auto identification in conjunction with blockchain. And uh, we do interoperability training and education. Um, I'm, I'm here doing this now. And I will be doing this again in June and a couple more times this year. Okay, the next group is the Open Applications Group. And uh, as, as we talked about at the top, I have a role with them. Uh, they were established uh, in 25 years ago, and they develop and maintain the world's most comprehensive canonical model. And I'm very, uh, very confident in making that claim. Uh, one of our recent set of publications, our RESTful API design specification, XML serialization specification, and JSON serialization specification, and a bunch of others. Oh, uh, and we worked in collaboration with NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, to develop a, uh, something called SCORE. It's an open source core component based standards management tool. And we'll talk more about that in, uh, let's see here, next week. Uh, we'll, die, we'll do a little demo of that tool. It's really impressive. Another important one, and that gateway is a very close collaborator with AEF, the Agriculture Industry Electronics Foundation. So this is, uh, you know, a bunch of the machinery manufacturers, you know, Deere, Agco, CNH, Jocto, Stara, uh, Amazone, those sorts of companies. Uh, uh, Topcon is part of that, and Trimble. And they're all about making the electronics on farm equipment uh, interoperate. And, and again, we collaborate with them because that gateway doesn't go down to the machine level per se. And so there's some overlap there. And we, we really work hard to make sure we're complementing each other's work. Next one is ASABE, the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers. Um, tell you what, I'm not going to get into that. I'll just mention them here in a couple slides in an example. Another big one is the Organization for the Advancement of Structured Information Systems, OASIS. Uh, they have produced a lot of standards that you're familiar with, and we'll get in, we'll touch on a couple of them next week. So one is uh, UBL, uh, Universal Business Language. You, you'll, you've probably heard a lot about that. Um, another one is GS1. I suspect all of you have heard of, of GS1. They're, they're probably about as well known as ISO. And most of the people think of them as, oh, they're the barcode people. Um, yes, that's true. So they, they define standards and, and, and designate ident blocks of identifiers for products called global trade item numbers or G10s and companies uh, for global location numbers and ship to locations, global location numbers. And uh, they have barcode standards, RFID standards. They work in retail, logistics, and healthcare uh, standards. And we will dive into the G10, GLN stuff more in two weeks when we talk about reference data and identifiers. Um, another one that is very well known is the W3C, the Worldwide Web Consortium. 
and um, we don't really need to get into this much. They're the ones who created the XML standard, uh, HTML standard, lots of web-related standards, as their name would suggest. There's IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force. Um, they create standards like uh, oh, SMTP for email, uh, HTTP, you know, the, the web protocol, things like that. Uh, there's Godan, and we do need to pick up the pace here. Um, Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition. Uh, you can read that, dig into it. AgroConnect. Uh, the Ag Gateway, the, the managing director for Ag Gateway Europe uh, serves as the managing director of AgroConnect, which is focused on agribusiness in the Netherlands. There is ICAR. Uh, I hope that some of you that are in dairy recognize, or dairy or uh, beef production uh, recognize this group. So I I think they're based in the Netherlands. Actually, I don't know for sure, but the International Committee for Animal Recording. So Ag Gateway has begun conversations with them about, you know, how, you know, what of their standards should we endorse to, to you know, help bridge some, some gaps we have in, in our support for interoperability for uh, livestock uh, data management. Uh, and then there's research organizations. So, uh, there's Landcare Research, and I won't try to pronounce the uh, uh, Maui uh, word there. Then there's CSIRO in in Australia. Then I've already mentioned NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is an agency of the United States Department of Commerce. And then another big one is uh, the Fraunhofer Institute, or or you can see the German spelling there. And uh, I've got an example of, of some of these uh, coming up in a second. And oh, I got a repeat there. Um, and then next is Atlas. So this, this is the Agriculture Interoperative Interoperability and Analysis System. Uh, this group was established in October. And it has a budget of over 15, I think 15.4 million euro. And it's a program uh, run by the EU. And the goal of Atlas is to achieve a new level of interoperability of agricultural machine sensors and data services and enable farmers to have full control over their data and decide which data is shared with whom in which place. So, as promised, relationships are key and i'm telling you all this stuff we've been talking about is a graph one big graph of organizations and standards and initiatives and things like that so we have this project of the eu again over 15 million euro budget the fraunhofer institute coordinates this so the eu said Hey, Fraunhofer, you are enormous and have a track record for managing complex projects. You manage the project or coordinate the project. That's their title. And oh, by the way, AEF was designated as project manager for a work package to Atlas. Now, I don't know for sure, but I presume that they report to Fraunhofer since Fraunhofer is coordinating the entire project. Well, we have that gateway. I mentioned just a moment ago that Ag Gateway and AEF collaborate a lot. So in the work package that AEF is responsible for, there are a number of things where Ag Gateway has done some work. So of course, it would make sense to just name those things, hopefully, uh, rather than recreate them and then have yet another standard. And of course, AEF is, is you know, inclined to explore those things. They, they see it as, as um, you know, their duty to look around and find what works and not reinvent the wheel uh, in terms of fulfilling their requirements as project manager for the work package. Next, we have NIST. Um, it turns out NIST collaborates on some projects, not Atlas, or at least not as far as I know, and they also collaborate with Ag Gateway. And then I throw in AEM, CNH Industrial, John Deere. 
So AEM is uh, the Association of Equipment Manufacturers in the United States, and you all are familiar with John Deere, CNH, Industrial, and Agco. All of those companies listed there, not AEM, they are members of both Ag Gateway and AEF. And then we throw in BDCA, uh, Banco de Dados Colaborativo de Agricultor, which is uh, Portuguese for uh, Farmers Collaborative Database. So this was announced last May, one year ago, uh, or nearly one year ago, in, at AgriShow. And this was, you know, this is spearheaded by Abimac, which is sort of like AEM for Brazil. Uh, spearheaded by Abimac and Jocto and Stara, which are two large uh, equipment manufacturers. They manufacture sprayer uh, equipment in Brazil. And so they're kind of doing the same thing in Brazil. So, I, you know, I think you guys know this. Everybody wants farmer data. There are all sorts of initiatives springing up and then all sorts of supporting standards springing up and then other standards and services about helping to move data around. So there is a lot going on. So uh, let me kind of get here to the end. Um, key elements of, of, of the standardization dynamics here are money control. So, so when you wonder what's going on in standards, often a good way to look, good place to look is where does the money come from and who's in control. Also, you need to just kind of be aware that there are people that sort of view standard stuff as a career and a lifestyle, and it's, it's an excuse to travel around. Make no mistake, I wish I was in New Zealand right now with my wife, uh, but, uh, but I'm not there, although I do take my job very seriously, more than a lifestyle. Uh, participation levels. We'll go into this here in a couple of weeks, or maybe next week with some detail, uh, but you will see all sorts of levels of participation. Uh, the power of stories is incredible in putting them in writing. We will cover that next week. Uh, the criticality of completeness and the peril of shortcuts. We will get into that next week. A lot of people want to skip process uh, modeling, and that's, that's, that's a bad thing. Uh, clarity over cleverness, we'll get into that a little bit next week too. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a good thing to have a really clever standard uh, when, when that cleverness is unclear to implementers. They just want to understand things and get it done. Um, and then there's this notion of don't let perfect be the enemy of good enough. You want completeness, you don't want to take shortcuts, but you can't make things perfect. And so the final example I have here is here's just a bunch of organization and here's the path of Ag Gateway's irrigation standard. And I think this is my last slide of substance, Kenneth, so you can get ready for Q&A. Uh, we have Ag Gateway. Ag Gateway hired CSIRO. We paid them 6,000 US dollars to advise us on a certain aspect, the observations and measurements aspect of our irrigation standards, because they have, uh, you know, one of their researchers led the ISO team that developed a standard around observation and me measurements. And uh, CSIRO was fantastic, worth every penny. So they advised us on the standard. We produced the standard, we submitted it to, uh, for US national standardization to ASABE. ASABE is an accredited is accredited as a U.S. national standards body by ANSI. I mentioned them earlier. ASABE then submitted the standard for international standardization to ISO, and Agate, the same Ag Gateway guys that developed the standard are now participating in an ISO technical committee to uh, bring it home to standardization. So. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Kenneth for Q and A. Uh... And thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. Appreciate all the effort that you put into getting us to that point. Um, we have the uh, question section and the chat. Uh, we can chat outwards, Tim and myself. There's a question session there, but I think really what we've covered today, and I'd be interested in information coming back to me. Uh, feel free to email. Um, or correspond, whichever is your chosen method. Um, 
it's the the picture that I think has been presented is one that puts what New Zealand is doing in context with a tremendous body of um, investment assets, uh, complexity, sophistication um, around the world. We're not alone. We're not isolated. And the whole point about interoperability is facilitating that. One thing that interoperability is not um, uh, supported by is isolated, asymmetric, disconnected uh, standards or protocols or databases or um, entities which live out on their own in their in their in their own isolation. So one of the things that I think uh, PANS initially and now PANS slash AgriTech, working alongside um, local and central government, um, working with uh, members across the whole raft of of um, farming, of ag tech businesses, of other technology companies, of research organisations, um, academia, the CRIs, um, central and local government is seeking to take what assets that we have, data linker being a good example. Um, there's some there's some very useful information that's been run by that organization, supported by Andrew Cook, who's going to join us later, um, managed by Rosaire. Um, New Zealand, for example, has particular expertise in pasture-based dairying. We have a lot of expertise in red meat, and there's a lot of asset value in there that we can both share with other parts of the world and that we can derive benefits back to us um, f from those uh, from that interchange so what we've sought to achieve today is a bit of a helicopter view um, a wide range of um, a, perhaps once over lightly and quite a quite a wide breadth of material but I hope what that's achieved is a common understanding of the tremendous uh, sophistication and asset value of a wide range of capabilities and resources that are available. So we will now uh, open up the wiki to you. You saw in one of Jim's opening slides a significant amount of uh, resource that's, that we've assembled in that wiki uh, on that view that uh, Jim's now exposed. You'll all have access to all of that. Uh, so you're welcome to go in there and dig around. Um, between now and next Tuesday, I welcome any input, feedback, comment, questions, um, advice. Um, this is a team sport and we can do well uh, with everybody contributing. Um, as they often say, and an expression that I like, nobody's as smart as all of us. So this is a real team effort. And I'm very grateful to over 100 people who have registered today, most of whom haven't had the wheels fall off and have been able to attend. Um, so we're right on closing time. There are a couple of questions that have come through. Um, what we will do next time um, is make, um, uh, as we go through the process, we will make it possible to contribute verbally. Um, cameras are a bit chew up a bit much bandwidth for this size of group, but certainly we look forward to more input from everybody. So thank you for your participation today. Um, you've got all, all got my email address. I'm happy for that to be shared amongst, uh, you know, in group uh, emails if you're circulating with, amongst your own team within the business. Um, Tim is helping. There are others in PANS that are supporting this effort. And Jim's happy to receive material as well, although I think probably in the first instance it would be good to curate it here in New Zealand because from sessions two and three, in particular, we will take on a particularly Kiwi bias uh, with a tip of the hat to our Australian cousins, um, and we'll progress into more uh, deeper material now. Um, so we're right on schedule for, for concluding. Thank you all very much. I hope you enjoyed your lunch and coffee while you were joining us. Um, I've got a mental picture of all sorts of studies and kitchen tables and perhaps outdoor tables in some parts of the country, certainly not further down south, they would have their feet in snow. So thank you all for your attendance and we look forward to speaking with you next Tuesday. Thank you and goodbye.